What's up, party people? It's Keys Dan with RadioWhat.com, DJLittleRock.com, coming to you live and in living color from the Radio What Studios. And this is my podcast, What Makes You Famous? It's an extension of the RadioWhat.com internet radio station that I've been running for quite some time. And if you need DJ services, where do I always send you? DJLittleRock.com. One more time, DJLittleRock.com. Check availability and get a free price quote, and maybe you can have me at your next event. You know I like to party with the people. The people need to be entertained. Let me entertain you. <laughs> I like to be a part of your show. Today on the program, I have Steve Andrews, the Bard of Ely. Who's that? What, is, what, what do you mean you don't know? Well, you're going to find out in the next few minutes, so stick around. This week's show's... On Friday night, I will be at the Rab in Conway, Arkansas. My regular Friday night gig, the video dance party, karaoke jam. Yeah, I said karaoke. You're the stars of the show. It's uh, it's the stage. All the world is a stage, and the stage is yours at the Rab for at least three to five minutes, whatever a song takes. They have a full bar. The kitchen's open. Pool tables. They have a pool tournament on Friday night. So if you want to try to make some money on a Friday night, I encourage you to check out the Rab. Yeah, you can make some money playing pool. You can do it. it takes a little bit of skill, but you can do it. I, I have faith in you. And while you're waiting, uh, yeah, this is all while you're waiting to sing on stage right next to me. They got great people, really fantastic people at the Rab. Every Friday night, that's where I get to be. Yay. <laughs> and then on Saturdays, Saturdays are made for weddings and parties and just private events. I, I enjoy I enjoy being a part of people's uh, big occasions, and I get to be an extension of them, an extension of you. I will be an extension of you. Uh, you pick the music. You pick the style you want me to be in, uh, high energy, low key, but I become an extension of you. On the Rab, usually I get to pick the theme, but I, I end up playing whatever the people want, and that's what I want to do for you at a private event. That's what I saved my Saturdays for. Yeah, exciting. All right, let's get into it with Steve Andrews, the Bard of Ely. I'm kind of excited. My goodness, I've been uh, waiting to, to talk to him. He, he looks like a very interesting fellow. And let's see what he, what he has to say about things. What's on Steve, Steve Andrews' mind? Let's get him on Skype right now. Skyping Steve Andrews, the Bard of Ely, now. <laughs> There he is. Yeah. <laughs> Legendary. Uh, time zones are wonderful. It's just now two, almost 2 o'clock uh, p.m. Central Time. And I'm guessing that you thought it might be one hour earlier. Uh, no, I, 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 thought, I thought it was 7 p.m. my time. Okay. Which, is, which I thought was 2 p.m. your time. I think we went on, on daylight savings time or some kind of standard time, and it, it fouled everything up. But either way, we're here. We're here we're now. Here. Yeah, yeah. And that's, what, that's what's important. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm so excited. My goodness. The, the, um, I, I don't do a lot of research on these things, but you can't help but research. If you look up Steve Andrews' Bard of Eli, you are, your presence is, is immense. It's out Thank there. You. It's colorful and it's very nature oriented. It's very with um uh, with the, uh, the you you're for the you're for the the trees as the uh, as Dr. Seuss would have said. But um, give the people an idea of who you are. Okay. Uh, well, um, I'm originally from Cardiff in in South Wales. Uh, I went to live, I lived in Tenerife in the Canary Islands for nine years, and then I moved to Portugal, which, which is where I am now, and I've been here for five and a half years. Now, uh, I'm a, a writer, uh, an author, a poet, a singer-songwriter, uh, I have been a TV presenter, uh, I have done a little bit of acting. I've done quite a bit of guest speaking uh, at, at various events. I've done that. So I, I do a lot of things. But uh, I'm known as the Bard of Ely because uh, I used to write for a magazine called Big Issue 
Uh, it's a magazine for homeless people. And they called me the Bard of Ely because I was living in Ely at the time. Uh, I'm not Ely, Cambridge, so I better clear this up because some people think, oh, Ely, no, no, not that one. Ely in Cardiff. But the Ely in Cardiff uh, is also where Shaking Stevens came from. So uh, there is actually a Wikipedia uh, entry with notable persons from Ely. I am one and Shaking Stevens is another. Uh, the green, I'm also known as Greenbeard, and um, this is because I have one. Uh, and this, this actually happened. People think, well, you know, what's all that about? In 2003, I was in the Green Man Festival, which is, uh, it's become quite a big festival now, but it was just kicking off in 2003. It was held in Bracken. And I was uh, a performer, singer-songwriter on stage, playing my guitar and singing songs, but I was also an MC. So I was going, you know, on and off the stage, introducing acts and talking between the, the, the various things which were going on. And I had a little goatee beard at the time, and I thought, well, you know, what if I dye that green? That'll be like really, you know, in keeping with the theme of this festival. So I put a little bit of green here on, 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 the, on the sides as well. And uh, I did the festival and all day people were coming up to me and saying, oh, you, the beard is so cool. And I said, oh, thank you very much. And so I basically I thought, OK, the green beard is a hit with the people. But then I had to go back to ordinary society after all this. So I, I went back to this, this large estate that I was living on Ely. And I thought, OK, well, you know, what are the, the young people, the kids of Ely going to make of it? And they liked it, too. So I'm getting the thumbs up and like the beard, Steve, and all this. So I'm thinking, OK, so the teenagers of Ely like the beard. And then the next day I had to go to the bank and I thought, OK, well, this is, you know, kind of official in a bank. I don't know what they're going to make of it. But the lady behind the counter, she complimented me on the beard as well. I thought, all right, the green beard is a hit. I will keep it. So I've had the green beard ever since, and uh, it's 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 done it's you know it's done me proud. It's basically uh, I once had a column in a, a newspaper in Tenerife, and the editor said to me, you know, when I was talking to him in his office, he said, "I need a photo of you with that green beard." And so they had a, and they used to run the photo of me with the green beard. And then in 2017, I was in Britain's Got Talent. And uh, I had to go through two auditions to get to this uh, audition, which was on the TV. But one of the first things one of the auditioners said to me was, I love the green beard. So, again, the green beard, I'm sure, you know, it helped me get on there. Well, Steve Andrews, the, the people that are listening to the audio podcast are, are getting only half of the uh, of the benefit i encourage you to check out the video version you are such a colorful character in so many ways this is something that you've been cultivating all right and I, I i perused your youtube page and it's 13 years old you must have been one of the first people uh, to be on youtube uh, it, there's and and yes you have the uh, the goatee that is dyed green and, and it's all out there you you've been well, from what I could see, you're an activist uh, of sorts. You're you're here to uh, to remind people that the Earth is um, is is the only it's the only Earth we got right now, right? And that's and, and we can't go anyplace else. I know uh, people are aspiring to go to the Moon and and Mars and maybe uh, and maybe mess those planets up as well. But we have to take care of this planet first. Is this something that you've been cultivating since you were a, a young lad, or, or is this something brand new? Oh, no, com completely. Um, I, I agree with you completely that, you know, that, I mean, this planet is getting completely messed up, and Elon Musk and people are talking about going to Mars, and as you said, you know, and mess them up as well. But we've got to sort out this planet we're on. We're on, you know, some people call it Mother Earth. We're, and this is our mother. This is the planet that is our home, you know, so... This is what we should be thinking about. And uh, uh, I, I don't think I did say earlier, actually, I'm, um, I am an activist. I'm an environmental activist. I'm also a naturalist, which is what I was doing when I was on TV. I was talking about stuff I was finding in the countryside. And, uh, well, actually, all of this started with me when I was a little boy. I would have been about four or five. 
I started to find insects and what was in the garden and we had a pet tortoise and I think in America you call them a turtle and uh, that was when my love for nature started and I used to say to my mum and dad you know um, can you get me some bo a book on insects and I want a book on wild so they used to get me all these books so I started reading very young about nature and that's when it started but uh, unfortunately for me all my life I've been seeing nature disappearing like when I was a little boy I used to think all of this is going to be here forever this is all amazing and then my mum used to take me to a park near where we lived and there was a pond there and there were tadpoles in the pond and there were newts in the pond and dragonflies and for me this was oh wow this is amazing but then guess what happened? They filled the pond in and made a flower bed out of it. And I was heartbroken. I was like, how they can't, they can't do that, but they did it. And I would have been about seven or eight then. So that was my introduction to nature getting destroyed. And I've been watching it all my life and about 19, hang on, maybe uh, 2000 and I'll say, 2010 around 2010 i got really concerned about all the plastic i was seeing everywhere and i started following david de rothschild uh, because he was uh, he was actually sailing a plastic boat across the pacific ocean it's called the plastiki and i started to find out a lot more about how bad the plastic situation is and it is really bad it's sort of mind-bogglingly bad you know it's there are five what are called gyres out in the oceans which are absolute masses of, of floating plastic and other rubbish and the one which is the great pacific garbage patch is, is said to be as big as texas maybe bigger than texas this is big you know and i started to discover about all this back then and i thought well uh, i gotta do something about this and i wrote a poem which is called where does all the plastic go and I put that on my websites, but you know, nothing really much happened with it. And then the years went by and I started thinking, well, maybe, maybe I should convert my poem into a song. Maybe I should take action as a protest singer. And, and some of my heroes as, as uh, singer songwriters, Bob Dylan is one. Bob is the guy that really started me on all this. Neil Young is another. And I'm thinking, well, look, even Neil Young, and Neil Young has kept up his writing of his protest songs, but Neil wasn't doing any, anything about plastic pollution. And I thought, okay, well, it's over to me. And so I, I converted my poem into a song, which is actually something which often happens. I wrote a, write a poem, I wrote the words first, and then I put a tune to it later, it becomes a song. But, uh, so I had the song, and I came up with an idea then as well. I thought, well, we've had Band Aid and we've had Live Aid, and Live Aid was massive, and we had all these really big name acts, Queen, and people like that were playing at, at Live Aid. And I thought, well, what we really need is Ocean Aid. This is what we need. We need to raise awareness of all the threats to the oceans, and we need to raise some money for some of these fantastic organizations like Sea Shepherd and Greenpeace and people that are out there doing something. So I came up with that idea as well. But then, you know, having said that, I, I'm talking to people when people are saying, oh, that's a great idea, Steve, but nothing is really happening apart from people are telling me how good it is. But then, uh, I think it was three years ago, there was a guy called Filippo Solibello, who's Italian, he's a radio host, and he contacted me on here on Skype and he said he wanted to interview me. Uh, he was writing a book called Spam Stop Plastica Amare. Uh, and uh, he wanted, you know, to write about me in this book. So, of course, I'm thinking, well, that's great, you know. So uh, I was talking to him about my song, about my idea for Ocean Aid. And he said, well, would I mind if he, if he talked to his media contacts in Italy about my Ocean Aid idea? I said, no, no, you, you, you tell them, you know, tell as many people as possible. I just want to see this happen, you know. And I asked him when the book was coming out. He said in the new year, the following year, which it did. I, he sent me a copy of the book. The book is brilliant. I've got an entire four page chapter, which is also called Where Does All the Plastic Go? And Filippo at that time was touring Italy promoting his book, yeah? He was also showing people the video of me doing the song Where Does All the Plastic Go? 
and he got his book to Pope Francis. And this got in the media over there as, you know, something of great interest that the Pope received a, a copy of this book. It's all going really well. And he was going to invite me over to Italy. And then the pandemic struck. Italy was one of the first countries to get hit badly. And that was the end of that. But before all this, I'd recorded the version of the song with Jace Lewis at his North Stone Studios in Bridgend in South Wales. And so I've got a recording of the song, I've got a video of the song, and the video of the song, by the way, was made over here in Portugal. And in the video, we've tried to contrast nature, the beauties of nature, with the disgusting situation with the plastic. So we've done that. And it shows me in my element of being out, you know, in nature. And uh, so we got that, but then there were lots of other things have happened, and, and things keep happening all the time, right? I was listening to Rick Barker. I don't know if you know Rick Barker. I did. Rick used to used to be the manager for Taylor Swift. Okay. And so that's why I think, okay, well, Rick is worth listening to. You know, he he knows what he's talking about. Rick was going on about how on the social media, Instagram is one of the best sites. Uh -huh. So I thought, well, uh, my Instagram is sadly neglected. I better sort it out, which I did. And then what happened then was uh, a Rotary Club from Australia found me. This is the Wyndham, Wyndham Harbour Rotary Club. And, and they said, uh, would I be interested in being featured in their magazine, The Wave? I said, no, no, I'd love to be featured in The Wave. So they did like a two-page feature in The Wave about me and the, the plastic, where does all the plastic go and all this. And what has happened actually since then, I've been going to these online Rotary Club meetings and I'm now a Rotarian. I've actually joined. So I've joined the Rotary Club of Wyndham Harbour. And uh, I'm told that this gives me access to all the Rotary Clubs worldwide. So now I'm a Rotarian and... Uh, and that's, that's something else which has come my way. But also uh, what has come my way is about a year, maybe a year and two or three months uh, ago, uh, I was on uh, the Ruin Who show from New York. And that was hosted by a guy called James Lane. And Rue Starr, who is really well known in New York as a singer, songwriter, an actress, and uh, well, again, Rue does all kinds of stuff like I do. And I, I joined that show and I soon found I, I could really relate to all the other people on the show. I became a regular and there were some really talented musicians on there, including Brute Force. I don't know if you've heard of Brute Force. I have not. Uh, okay, well, Brute Force's real name is Stephen Friedland. His claim to fame, which is a massive one, is that uh, he was uh, on the Apple label uh, many, many years ago, because George Harrison and John Lennon thought the brute force should definitely be on their label with his song, The King of Fur. And this is what he's known for, his song, The King of Fur. And in this song, there's a line, all hail the fur king. Now, it is not actually using the, the F word, but it sounds like it is. Right. And so... And so what happened, which was really unfortunate for Brute Force, was that although the Apple label printed, I think it was a thousand copies of this single, The King of Fur, EMI, which is the big music distributor, and Capitol Records said, oh, no, no, we're not going to ha have distribute that. This is terrible. And the radio stations all said, we cannot play that because it's got the fuck w word in it, the, the, the fucking and so that was the end of that. But, you know, it was like for him, it was, a, a, it was almost his big worldwide break, but it, it didn't happen. Do you think anyway, it was intentional actually, or, or, or just incidental? Sorry? Do you think was, it was intentional that he did the Fur King or was it? Oh, uh, yes, 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 it was intentional. It was, it, it was, uh, it, it's basically the, the story of the King of Fur. Right. Uh, and it's, it's a really, oh, it's a beautiful song. I mean, Anyway, I, uh, it, it's talking about why do people not worship beauty? And um, anyway, I, I heard the song, like, like Brute playing the song on the Ruin Who show, and I thought, well, this is amazing. And Brute is actually aged 80. And, and so I'm actually putting in a plug for him now. So if you want to get hold of Brute Force and have him on your show, I, I think that would be, be really good. But anyway, 
uh, I met him on the show and I met, you know, a lot of other people. I'm thinking, okay, this is great. But what came about through that, through the Ruin Who, Who show was Joel Landy, who is one of the regulars, said to me, uh, there's a, a show from New York called Ecologic. And he thought I'd be ideal on this. So uh, what did I think about that? Again, I said, yes, please, Joel, please get me on Ecologic. So I've been on there as a guest speaker and playing my song. And something else which happened was I thought, because there's nothing really has happened with my Ocean Aid idea, apart from everybody's told me how good it is, we ought to actually have one. We ought to do some kind of online version of it. So I asked all the people on the Ruin Who show, including Brute Force, if they'd like to accompany me as performers on an online uh, Ocean Aid show. And they said yes, and so February this year we did this, and we raised funds for Sea Shepherd. Wow. And Sea Shepherd, by the way, is the charity that I've decided is the one that I am personally want to, you know, really support. So how and do we get a hold of that? Something else which no, has tell, happened. Tell us more about Sea Shepherd. What is about that? About Sea Shepherd. Uh, okay, well, Sea Shepherd, um, it, it, they are a, an organization which is out on the sea with their boats, um, taking action to stop things like uh, whales being killed and overfishing and anything which that they say is like illegal uh, acts being committed on the high seas. Sea Shepherd are there to try and stop that. And they're run by a guy called Captain Paul Watson, who Captain Paul Watson, if you Google him, he's been on the news loads of times as the, the man behind Sea Shepherd. And there are a lot of celebrity people that support uh, Sea Shepherd. Uh, Mick Jagger is one, and uh, um, uh, uh, Daryl uh, Hannah, I believe, yeah, she supports Sea Any Anyway, as I say, it it's a, a very well-known uh, organization. And we raised some money for Sea Shepherd. But then this takes me on to, like, some, I mean, uh, this is an international thing, right? Because the oceans are international. Oh, yeah. And, and I thought, well, I want to see Ocean Aid happening worldwide. And uh, what happened next was there's a, a magazine from Wales, which is where I'm from originally, uh, a magazine called Sund. And Sund is sound. And uh, they have a label as well, a Sund label, Sund Records. And I was invited to have like a feature article in their, in their magazine. So that I did, and that's all about, you know, my song and about Ocean Aid. And so I'm thinking, okay, so that's Italy, uh, Australia, America, New York, Wales. Um, and so I'm starting to get kind of international with this. But I forgot to say as well, so here where I am in Portugal, I don't know how I can forget this. I'm on the front page of this. I don't know if you can see, this is the Portugal News. And there, yeah, and it says, Singing Against Pollution, page 11. And I, maybe I can find that. And I, That's an uh, actual newspaper. I missed here newspapers. We are. Page 11, there we are. There's a Portugal-based singer-songwriter sings about plastic pollution. So... Uh, so Portugal is covered. So, uh, you know, what's happening is I'm, what I'm trying to say is I'm getting known around the world for being the guy singing about plastic pollution and trying to get ocean aid going. And we got this online version uh, done with Brute Force and uh, other regulars from the Ruin Who show. And then about, what is it, two months, two and a half months ago, somewhere around that time, um, uh, the, uh, somebody who is the head of the publishing, cause I, I, I'm an author, yeah, and I've got like three books out on herbs. And Trevor, who is one of the main people behind this publisher, was, was talking on Facebook about a series of books they've got going, Earth, Earth Spirit series, and how he wanted somebody to write about the oceans. And I said, well, look, Trevor, I'm already doing this. I've got a song about the oceans. I'm in a book about the oceans. I'm trying to organize Ocean Aid concerts. I've done an Ocean Aid concert with people online. I've been in this Welsh magazine. I've been, in, I've been on a show in New York. 
I'm in a Rotary Club from, from, uh, from Australia now. He said, all right, Steve, you've got the job. So basically, uh, I got a contract man to write a book, and the book is called Saving Mother Ocean. And I'll just explain us a little bit about that. I've decided that, you know, so many people are talking about Mother Earth, but really it's Mother Ocean because uh, the ocean is where all life started. Science tells us that. Science says that, you know, millions of years ago, whenever it was, the first life started in the ocean. And uh, science today will tell us that the ocean uh, maintains life for the rest of the, of the planet. So the ocean really is the mother. So I thought, okay, so saving mother ocean. And I told Trevor, you know, what I wanted to put in the book. I said, well, I'm, I'm going to write about all the bad stuff going on. He said, that's, that's fine, Steve, as long as you put, like, you know, something to balance that about what's being done, the solutions that people are coming up with. And so uh, I got cracking with writing that book. The book is completed. Um, and I did it in six weeks, which was amazing, but yeah, I did it. And I've got some incredible endorsements for it. I mean, incredible. Uh, Captain Paul Watson has endorsed it, who I've just mentioned, uh, who founded Sea Shepherd. Uh, a young lady called Lily Platt, if you Google her, she's a global youth ambassador. She's age 13. Lily was famous also for running Lily's Plastic Pickup. And uh, she walks her talk. She's often featured little videos and photos of herself out there picking up plastic and other rubbish. And she's been doing this with her grandma, a, a, a grandpa rather, a grandpa Jim. And uh, she knows uh, Greta Thunberg. Okay. And I'm sure you know Greta, like everybody knows. And she's actually a personal friend of Greta's, and they've been to uh, one of these summits together. Anyway, uh, Lily has endorsed my book. Um, Alan Herrera, who is Wait, a, a film director. Before you go any further, I do want to talk about Greta Thunberg because uh, oh, yeah. you did put that video out about her, and I had no idea until I until I looked on your page and found out about her. So Greta Thunberg, she's a a very very young lady who has big ideas about how to save the planet and she's calling out the people of the world the leaders of the world in particular to uh get them to take action so uh yeah that's a driving force steve andrews you're you're the uh becoming the the change you want to see in the world but continue continue and i'm glad that you're giving credit where credit is due keep going yeah okay uh, thank you yeah, yes uh in in fact um Greta, I think, is doing an amazing, amazing job. And, and as you say, she is calling out world leaders, uh, you know, and it, she doesn't sort of hold back at all. You know, she says what she thinks. And if people don't like it, well, tough. You know, I mean, what she's saying really is we're in a crisis and we should be taking the crisis seriously. And, and world leaders are not doing that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I completely agree with her. And I... Uh, I, I mentioned Greta in, in, in my book, and in fact, I've got an entire chapter in the book called uh, Let the Children Lead Us, and uh, Lily is in that chapter as well, and, uh, you know, I told Lily about that, and in fact, Lily has, has said to me that she will help kind of promote the book, like when, it, when it's out, so I've got a lot of um, quite big name people, you know, uh, be, behind uh, or supporting me, rather, with this book. And uh, I, I didn't finish saying, I, um, Alan Herrera, Alan Herrera is a film director, and he has given me a, a glowing endorsement for it as well. And uh, Alan uh, knows, I mean, you know, I talk to him, uh, you know, in messages, emails and things, but basically uh, he, uh, he directed uh, a documentary back in, when was it, 19, 1990, I think it was, uh, which was called um, From the Heart of the World, the, the Elder Brothers Warning. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this, but it, it's an amazing documentary. It's worth, like, Google it, find it on YouTube. It's about some people called the Kogi people, and uh, they live in, in Colombia on a, a mountain chain now called the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. And these, uh, the people who are the leaders of the tribe are called the Mamas, 
and they uh, they are in incredible people. But basically, they have uh, a lot of work that they do, kind of rituals and ceremonies and things that they do, which they believe uh, is is helping the planet to you know to be healthy. And they believe that they are the guardians of the planet. And they believe that where they live, where they live, this mountain is the heart of the world. Hence the name for the documentary. And they call all of us the, the younger brother. They believe that they were created like before us and all the people in the rest of the world, the younger brother, and that we are making a mess of things, basically, which is why they wanted to warn us. And they they made uh, they gave a message. They invited Alan to go up and meet them on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And they said that uh, the younger brother is is creating dams, he's, he's cutting down the forests, he's drilling and mining and ripping away at everything, and he must stop. And if he doesn't stop, what, this is what they said, the world will come to an end. And they meant it. And uh, they showed uh, Alan on the film, he's up on the peak of the mountain, and he, he explains that the Kogi Mamas were very concerned because on that mountain peak, they should have snow and ice. And this is where all the water comes from, because when it melts, it goes down into rivers and it goes down onto the, the lower parts of, of where they live. And there wasn't any. And he, he, there was like some shrubs growing there. And he went like this with his hand and it crumbled to dust. And he said, this is what the Kogi Mamas were really worried about. Now, I had uh, an experience in, when was it, 2000 and, 2012? 2012, I was living in Tenerife then, and I went up on Mount Teide. Mount Teide, by the way, is the highest mountain, not only in the Canary Islands, but all of Spain. And I knew what it should be like up on Mount Teide, right? I went up there with a friend who was going to make some kind of video of me, and uh, uh, I was hoping to show her Mount Teide in all its glory in, in January. And there should be some snow up there, there should be some plants growing, because in the winter we get all the rain and the snow, and it, and it was terrible. Uh, there were, all the plants were dying, uh, there was no snow at all, and the sun was, was beaming down with, with heat. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is awful. Mount Tady should not be like this, you know? And, and what I, I said, like Alan Herrera on the, the Kogi documentary, is uh, talking about how the, the plants are crumbling to dust. This is exactly what happened. I go to, you know, to hold one of the, the little shrubs that grew on the ground there, and it crumbled to dust, and I could see it was dead. And I thought, oh, my God, this is awful. Uh, and so I was experiencing for myself exactly what the Kogi Mamas were worried about and the Sierra Nevada to Santa Marta in Colombia. And uh, I was talking to people that, you know, that I knew in the media about this, about how terrible this was. And people are saying, oh, no, it'll be all right, Steve. You know, you told me, I mean, don't worry, don't worry. It'll be OK. The rains will come. And guess what? The rains didn't come. And that year they had like a, a terrible drought and the farmers in Tenerife, you, you know, it, it was awful in every way. The crops failed. And, and I thought, uh, what the Koki Mamas warned about is actually happening. And I'm seeing it, you know, for myself in, in real life here. So, of course, I mentioned the Koki Mamas and, and Alan Herrera in my book, which is how Alan came to be involved in this because I told him about this and he's endorsed it. So I've got some top people uh, endorsing my book. Well, you're seeing it all firsthand. You're going That's around right. from place to place and you're actually seeing mountaintops that are not covered with snow as they should be. I mean, just uh, just over in the next state or two, there's Colorado. And I, I've seen uh, or I've, I've seen photos of where snow should be on caps at certain times of the year and it's just not there and i, I haven't seen it firsthand but i've seen it on videos and, and people keep saying how the uh, the polar ice caps are melting and and, and yes there climate change is real whether you believe that the that that it's man-made or what have you the climate is changing and, and we're going to have a, a struggle to to live the way we are right now in the near near future is that what you're understanding Oh gosh, yeah, very much so. Uh, I mean, I, I'm 
uh, people who think that you know Greta Thunberg uh, is is a bit too much, you know, with what she says, I, I'm just as, just as bad, you know. I mean, in fact, if they give me the the kind of platform she's got, that it'll be the same for me. There'll be people, oh, that's Steve Andrews, I, you know, what is he saying? He should shut up, you know. He's and they can say whatever they want to say about me. I don't care. I, I'm I'm just telling the truth. I'm telling it like it is. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, what, what is going to happen is that if this crisis is not being taken seriously, which Greta is talking about, and if, uh, if the use of, of fossil fuels is not cut down on drastically, and if we, we don't make a lot of changes into the way of life that people are living, then it's just going to continue getting worse and worse and worse. And already we've got the ice caps are melting. Uh, Canada has got record temperatures up there right now as we speak. There are like terrible wildfires up there. Uh, I know like in California it's getting terrible wildfires. Portugal, where I live, every year now has terrible wildfires. And this is happening. Uh, it, it's not something, you know, that, that we're making up or that this is just real. And uh, the as well as the ice caps melting, Greenland is melting, and uh, Antarctica is melting. And so uh, it, it's pretty obvious to me and to a lot of people that if the ice melts, it's going to have to go somewhere. Where is it going to go? Like the plastic, into the sea. What happens when it goes into the sea? The sea level rises. Where are all the main uh, cities of the world? Where are, are all of them? London, New York, you know, you think of a, uh, a main city, uh, Lisbon over here, mm -hmm. they're all right on the coast. What happens when the, the water rises? It's going to flood the cities. What happens when the cities are flooded? Well, you know, I think, I think anybody can answer that question. Basically, civilization as we know it is finished. No, because I'm, if all I'm, the main cities yeah. are underwater, then that's it. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm from South Florida and the Florida Keys, and most of that was uh, three feet above sea level. And I could see if all that melts, it's not going to become water world like the Kevin Costner movie. But certainly uh, the, the main cities that are located across, uh, uh, along the, the water, which is a smart thing. You locate your city along the water so you can have that water source. But if that water source takes your city over, then, then it, it, it's bad news for you. But continue, please. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, completely. I'm just thinking also of Miami, that Miami, I think, is already having problems. And, and they are, I believe they're taking sort of, um, they're, they're doing something about that, that they're trying to like have flood defenses and things. Mm -hmm. But uh, what, what I'm thinking is that uh, this, is, this is just going to be so massive so massive that it's difficult a lot of these things it's difficult for people to get their heads around it and i'm the same you know it's it's even if we just talk about the great pacific garbage patch being as big as texas or bigger made mostly of floating plastic how can you can't really picture that mm -hmm. you know all these things are so so big so vast so mind-boggling that it is difficult to to understand them and uh, the if we think about all of the cities on on the coast and like you were saying and and I agree that it was at one point in time it made complete sense to build a city on the coast it's where all the shipping you know the, the ships would come in they would bring whatever goods that they were they were carrying from maybe from other parts of the world or whatever and it was uh, an area where all of the main sort of the commerce and, and, and communication was going from for the rest of the world. Right. You know, sailors were going from one city on the coast to another city on the coast. And, and this is how it was all running. But they were not having to deal with high levels of, of the sea then because we, we didn't have global warming then. This is all comparatively new. Yeah. And so when the cities were all originally built, it was all fine. And I come from a city, Cardiff, in South Wales, which I mentioned earlier. And Cardiff basically made most of its money from coal because they have the coal mines in, in the Welsh Valleys and there was a lot of money made through that. 
And again, the ships were coming in and out of Cardiff as part of Cardiff, Cardiff Docks, it's called Cardiff, uh, called Tiger Bay. And this was, again, a big city, the capital of Wales, and now it, it's joining all the other cities. It's going to be like um, threatened by, by, by the sea. And uh, already we actually do have in Wales, which is, this is in my book, there is um, a, a seaside village in, in Wales, which uh, is being threatened by the rising tide. And the residents there have been told they're going to have to leave this, this particular place. I can't remember the name of it, but mm. they're going to have to leave this place in, I think it's the next 10 or 20 years. And it is being forecast that this, this whole place is going to go under the water. And this is terrible. I mean, there's people there spend a lot of money buying their houses and, and their houses are now worthless. You know, they, they cannot sell them. And, and, uh, and that, is, that is really happening in Wales now, that there is a, a seaside uh, village which is going to be threatened by rising sea. Steve Andrews, I, I'm so glad. Um, you're, you're teaching me more about Cardiff. The only thing I knew before Cardiff is that Doctor Who visited there quite a bit. And 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 uh, I did see on a Facebook that uh, that that you were uh, vying to be Doctor Who back in 2018. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's actually very true that um, Cardiff is very associated with Doctor Who, and I uh, watched Doctor Who since I was a boy. It's one of I mean I'm a sci-fi freak completely. I, I love sci-fi films and and uh, Doctor Who. Um, there was a kind of a connection which was amazing that, that I have. Well, not not me personally, but the street the street that I was brought up in in Cardiff, uh, where my parents lived. Up the road from there is the house where Terry Nation lived, and I don't know if you know who Terry Nation I was, but Terry Nation was the man that came up with the Daleks. He was the creator of the Daleks, That's and he tech. used to live up the road from my parents. And there is a, a commemorative plaque there now saying, you know, this is the house that, that, where Terry Nation lived. So that was a, a kind of a connection uh, for me with, with Doctor Who. But then um, there's a part of Cardiff that, I want to tell you some more about Cardiff now. There is a city within the city. There's a city called Landeth, which is a city because it has a cathedral uh, in, in Britain. If you have a cathedral, this, this can make, uh, make it into a city. Okay. So it's Land of Cathedral, which is uh, Land of City in the city of, land, in the city of Cardiff. So there were two cities there. Anyway, uh, I was brought up in Land of. I went to school in Land of. My parents lived in Land of. Terry Nation used to live in Land of. And they've been filming a lot of the Doctor Who episodes in Lander. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Cardiff has got a lot of connections with Doctor Who. Now, years ago, people were saying saying to me and about me that I'd make a good Doctor Who, which is true. I mean, I, I you know I think I could do great as Doctor Who. I, I've got the look, you yeah. know. I, I think um, you could wear that exact outfit as do, as could, your doctor. I, I could be on there like this. Yeah, you're right. You know, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I've I've got that kind of eccentricity about me, which you know all the the top doctors have. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I thought, yes, if I could get to be Doctor Who, that would be brilliant. So there, but there is so there's a Facebook group somewhere which I think is called Steve Andrews is the next Doctor Who. Yep. Uh, I haven't been picked as Doctor Who yet, but you never know. Uh, in, in my life, it's very much like that. It's like I never really know, you know, what's going to happen next. And I can, I can like aim for something. And but then once it starts happening, I don't know where it's going to go. It's like I'm saying with this Ocean Aid thing, it, it's opening lots of doors for me. I, uh, if you said to me last year, uh, Steve, did you know you're going to be a member of the Rotary Clubs? I, I, don't, I don't even really know what a Rotary Club is. You I'm know, not sure what that, a Rotary but... Club is. I think I was a member of the Lions Club only because my grandmother signed me up and I did a, f a few little jobs for them. But what does the Rotary Club uh, get involved in? Oh, okay. Well, uh, very briefly, the, 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 rot the Rotary Clubs are people, uh, again, all around the world uh, who uh, in some way can help their community. 
So uh, they're concerned with helping education. They're, they're concerned with, with, with any way at all that people uh, in an area can be helped. The Rotarians will, will try and, and do that. Thank you. Um, and, and there are like Rotarians all over the world. Um, Thank you. So well, that, that's loosely what, what being a Rotarian is about. Um, so it, it could be about uh, helping with local agriculture, helping with the local education system, um, helping to raise money for, for some fund locally, anything at all really that, that helps helps people. Well, it looks, and, Steve uh, Andrews, it looks like your 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 efforts are really strong in trying to get the word out about uh, Mother Earth and Mother Ocean. And I know, I know that uh, particularly you're, you're into butterflies, which is why I put yeah. on the background of this uh, video, I put little butterflies flying around. Uh, they, every once in a while, you see their wing. And yes, you had a video of you with a butterfly in the, in the beard. And if you're, like I said, if you're listening to the audio version, he just put a, uh, a butterfly in his beard. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> well, tell me what your fascination with butterflies is, and and how they relate, uh, and how uh, are they being are, are they having problems with the climate oh. changing? Yeah. Uh, okay. I I I, I told you like when I was a little boy, four or five, I started to discover insects in the garden, and and I'd ask my mom and dad to get me books, which they did, and so I started to learn about insects. And one of the uh, the forms of, of of insects that I found as a, as a child was were caterpillars. And of course, I was fascinated because some caterpillars are, are maybe they're long and green and other caterpillars have got fur all over them. They're fluffy caterpillars and some have got little kind of colored spots on them. And, and, and there were some which in America you call them inchworms. And in, Amer in, in Britain, we call them like looper caterpillars and, and they can make like little loops as they walk. And, and so I'm, I'm finding all these caterpillars and I used to keep them. I'd put them in a jam jar and, I, and I'd feed them with the leaves that they eat. And then they change into a cocoon or a chrysalis if it's a butterfly. And then it changes into a butterfly or a moth. And for me, this was amazing, you know. And, and I'm feeling uh, a kind of pride in, in having looked after that insect. And, and I'm learning more and, and I'm still learning. Like I'm learning here in Portugal about, you know, species which are over here. And uh, so my fascination, fascination with, with insects, with, with moths and butterflies started when I was a little boy. And again, like I've been saying about everything else, if I've seen ponds disappearing, I've seen plastic ruining everything. I, I, see, oh, I see trees being cut down everywhere, including here in Portugal. And, and uh, all this destruction that I'm seeing is having a terrible effect on the butterflies. Now, uh, in America, you've got the monarch butterfly, which is kind of world famous. And over here, and this is a monarch butterfly, over here in Portugal, I'm helping the monarch butterfly. In fact, if I went out the kitchen, um, I've got like a, a, a large plastic water bottle without any water in it with a load of monarch butterfly caterpillars in it. And I'm looking after monarch butterfly caterpillars and I grow milkweed here in the garden. And I, I know a lot of people in, in America that are doing this as well. And there are groups on, on Facebook for people who help the monarchs. And, and I'm also helping the swallowtail butterfly, which is over here uh, in, in Portugal. And uh, yeah, you, unfortunately, worldwide, the butterflies and moths are having a terrible time and the numbers are declining fast. And there are many reasons. One of the main reasons is the use of pesticides, which are basically poisons. Farmers are spraying vast amounts of pesticides and herbicides to kill weeds. Roundup is one of the, uh, the worst of all. Spraying this stuff all over their crops. And it kills not only uh, the pesticide, like an insecticide kills insects, yeah? So they're not only getting killed directly, but they're, the plants that their caterpillars eat are being killed. So they haven't got any food for the caterpillars. So this is happening worldwide. So moths and butterflies are having a terrible time. 
Well, I, I, so, Steve Andrews, I know I'm guilty. I, I have to say it right here that I'm guilty of using a, a lot of these products that you're 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 mentioning right now, and and I've refrained from using them uh, more recently because I know that they are harmful. Uh, these are are poisons that are are meant to kill insects, which uh, you know, kind of if you're killing one human, th- uh, one being, uh, you know, what, what makes you think it's not going to be detrimental for another being, right? Yeah, that's right. And and uh, and first of all, I just like to say, you know, thank you for for owning up and admitting that. And I, I'm just going to come into something in my book very briefly. I just say that in my book that I think that people people can take action, you know, in, in any way that they feel. And and we all have to take, you know, whatever action that, that we feel that, that we can we can do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, I mean, I'm a person that doesn't use insecticides. Yeah, I'm a person that tries to cut down on my use of plastic. Um, but you know, we have to start somewhere. So, you know, if you if you realize something, and like you've realized that maybe they, these chemicals are not good, then if you use less of them, then that's that's a help. You know, like I I, I say. Uh, any reduction of any of the things which are destroying everything is worth doing, you know. So it's something to think about. But uh, you, you're completely right on what he was saying about the, that if you kill like one type of, of insect with, with an insecticide, it's going to kill the other insects, you know. So if it's there, and, and this is this is again, this is terrible, it's really bad. And um, people that have cats and dogs are told by their vets that they must treat the the cats and dogs with flea killers and tick killers. And you put these things, I'm sure, uh, well, you know, I don't know whether you do know, but you know, if you, if if you get cats or dogs, you can put a thing like you put a spot on the back of the neck with the insecticide and it goes in the fur and then that kills any, any pests like fleas and ticks that are going to go on, on your cat or dog. And this is all well and good in a way because, okay, it's stopping uh, the fleas and ticks. But what isn't good is it's ending up in rivers. And if you have a pet dog and you take your dog down to the river, what is the first thing the dog does? It runs in the river. What happens to the insecticide all over its fur? It washes off into the river. And uh, it's been... This has been proved in the UK that they've been doing like surveys to check out, you know, what's the state of the river water. And most of the rivers, in fact, I think all the rivers in the UK uh, have got contamination from insecticides, which are uh, flea and tick killers that have been used on people's ca- uh, cats and dogs. Mm. So this is little things like that. And there were so, and when I say little, they're not little because there's so many people doing it. And this is the main problem that. And and I'm not saying you know that I'm not even I'm not saying I, I'm any better than anybody else. Right. What I'm saying in my song, you know, in my my plastic song, I'm saying, you know, where did all the plastic go into the sea? How did it get there? You know, was it you or was it me? And I'm not you know it could be anybody. Like if I throw some, and I'm aware of this. Like if I throw some plastic away, even into a recycling skip. I don't know for sure that that recycling skip is going to be one be recycled or whether it's going to go in a landfill or maybe the wind will blow and blow some of that plastic out. Steve you know, Andrews, it's very I, hard to, I, to guarantee from all the, the documentaries I've seen. I know for sure that most of that stuff in that recycling bin is not going to be recycled. That's right. You're, you're absolutely spot on you're right there. Yeah. So even when we've got, you know, the best will trying to do something to help, you know, it, it's still, it, it's nowhere near enough, you know. And uh, all these things, uh, so many sources of plastic. And again, I, I said, I'm learning something all the time. And in, in the last year, uh, I, I learned that, the tires, vehicle tires, tires of a, of a car or a, or a lorry, a truck, you call them in America, right. uh, they used to be made of rubber. And so, um, you know, people think, oh, well, that, that's harmless. It, you know, it's, it's organic. It's, it's rubber. No, the, the tires of vehicles are nowadays made of plastic and rubber. Mm-hmm. And there's a large amount of plastic in the tires. So when a car is, is going along a road or a van going along a road, yeah, 
Some of that plastic in the form of microplastics, which we can hardly even see, is going on the road from the wear and tear of the tire on the road. And if you think about how many vehicles on the road, again, mind boggling worldwide, we've got cars and, and, and trucks on the road and, and all of this is contributing to the microplastics. This and, is something uh, that I just recently started you know, hearing uh, about. Yeah, uh, this is something that I just started hearing about was the microplastics. The little insects oh. eat the little plastic, then the, the oh. bigger insects and the bigger animals, and then we end yeah. up eating the yeah. microplastics. They end, they end up in our bodies. That's right. So true. And, and uh, in the oceans, uh, the plankton, which is the, you know, the really tiny forms of life, they are eating the microplastic. Mm -hmm. And so then you have like another tiny creature, like a really tiny fish, or a tiny crab, and, and these really tiny forms of life, what do they eat? They eat the plankton. What are they eating when they eat the plankton? They're eating tiny bits of plastic, microplastic. As they grow bigger, it, it gets worse. If you're a big fish, or if you're a whale, or if you're a turtle, you, you, you're eating big bits of plastic. This is like so bad. I, I don't know if you've seen, I mean, there's lots of photos and footage of this and albatrosses whereby the, the baby, the albatross chick is dying and, and their guts are full of plastic. And, and there's footage of this of like a, a, a parent bird is feeding the baby with what it thinks is food. It's found in the sea and it's feeding it with something like a cigarette lighter mm. or a plastic straw or all this junk, plastic stuff, the birds are finding that in the sea and feeding it to their babies, and it's killing the babies. The turtles, I, I was actually with a, a science teacher, who was a friend of mine in Tenerife, yeah, and we took a, a party of the, of the children down the beach to, to look at the plastic pollution, and I, I told my friend Dino about how the turtles, uh, they eat plastic, and, and uh, and they think that they're supposed to be eating jellyfish, yeah? But if they see like a plastic fla uh, a plastic bag or uh, cling film, you know, this stuff like floating about in the water, mm -hmm. they think, oh, it's a jellyfish. They go to eat it. They're swallowing a large amount of plastic. And it, it, it's, uh, it, it's absolutely horrible. But th this is happening on a regular basis now. M most of the turtles in the sea have got plastic in them. Most of the seabirds have got plastic in them. Whales, you've probably seen the news stories, like a, a dead whale somewhere, whale beached. And, um, and then they do an autopsy on the whale, and in its, in its stomach, what do they find? They find plastic bags, fishing line, ropes, balls, all kinds of stuff, just junk, plastic junk that the whale has swallowed. And uh, it, all of it's getting worse because not only is there all this plastic in the sea and, and these animals are swallowing it, but often because of overfishing, which is another absolute disaster, which is going on all the time, because there's not enough fish in the sea now because the humans are taking it, there's nothing for the, for the, the animals that live in the sea, the seals and the turtles and the, the whales and the seabird, there's nothing for them to eat. So they, they're starving, they go, what, what can we eat? Oh, is the, well, it looks like, it looks like something we can eat. Right. And, and they eat a plastic bag or they, or they eat, you know, anything that's floating about there and it's plastic, they're eating it. And it's disastrous. And uh, the microplastics, as you said, the micro, they're so small, you know, we can't even see them a lot of the time. And I remember, again, like years ago, when I first started finding out about how bad it all is, that there were beaches. In fact, there's a beach in Hawaii that I'm thinking of. And it looks like sand, mm -hmm. but it's not sand. Mm -hmm. Most of it is particles of plastic. And this is how, how bad it is, you know, that you're having, you're having like a, a beach which is being converted into with plastic sand. And most of the, the sea creatures have got plastic in them. The tiniest creatures, the, pl uh, the plankton, have got plastic in them. The, the biggest creatures, the whales, have got plastic in them. And as you said, which is again completely spot on right, we've got plastic in us because we're, we're swallowing this microplastics. Like if I, if I go to get a drink of water or if I buy a drink, the chances are it's got microplastics in there somewhere. 
um, if we eat fish, yeah, fish has often got plastic in it. Uh, I, I've seen footage of, of a fisherman, yeah, gutting a fish. What's inside the fish's gut? Plastic, all the little bits of uh, chunks of plastic. So uh, the the reality of, of the threat of, of plastics in our food is is oh, it, it's just terrible. Uh, and what 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 in a way is worse is that nobody really knows how to how to stop this or to get all this plastic is already out there you know how can we get rid of it how can we get how i mean can we get people, rid of it yeah i mean that there are people working on getting actual you know big pieces of plastic mm -hmm. out of the sea yeah, there are people all, and this is wonderful, all around the world doing beach cleanups. Mm -hmm. So they go along and they collect the plastic they find on the beach and they put it in a, in a container and, 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 and take it away. And, and, and that's happening all around the world. That's great. But all the microplastic is floating about in the water in all the oceans worldwide. And the microplastic is so bad that it's up in the air because if the, the wind can blow it, if there's, there's microplastic on the beach and the wind blows, it can blow the particles of plastic up into the air. And where does the, the microplastic that's in the air, where does it go? It ends up in the rain clouds and it comes down in rain. So, you know, for years we've had the problem of acid rain. We've got plastic rain now. And so you can go to the top of, you know, maybe one of the highest mountains in the world, like Mount Everest, yeah, in the Himalayas, and you can find microplastic in what's left of the snow in a place like that. And so the microplastic has been found everywhere. It's been found in, at the North Pole and the South Pole, Antarctica. It's been found on the tops of mountains. It's in the rain. It's, it's in the oceans everywhere. And, and it, it's, it, it's, it's everywhere in land because everywhere you've got a road, yeah, and there are cars driving, their wheels are generating microplastic, which again, a wind, a wind blowing across the road is blowing all the dust. A lot of that dust is microplastic all over the place. Well, Steve Andrews, um, I, I know that anyone who's on social media, anyone that can watch a television has to know that these problems do exist. I mean, what what can we, we do? I guess just cut down as here I am talking yeah. to you on a plastic microphone with a plastic headset on a plastic computer and using a plastic light uh, to light my face here. You know, it, there's plastic all around me, uh, but uh, what can I do? What I can do is, is to, is not, uh, you know, try to use it as long as possible without throwing it away as quickly as I need to, or, or I mean, Oh, very, very much so. Um, something I learned again years ago, going back to David de Rothschild and the Plastiki, was that he was talking about the, the four R's or the five R's, if you want to add another one, which are not reading, writing and arithmetic, but reduce, which is something you said, like using less plastic or buying less plastic, refuse which is refusing plastic. So when you go in the shop and they want to give you a plastic carrier bag, say, no, thank you. Bring your own cloth bag so you can put whatever you're buying in there. Refuse, recycle, and okay, admittedly, a lot of it won't end up recycled, but you can try. Some of it will, and it's better that some does than none of it. So recycle, reuse. So if you've got something that you can use again, made of plastic, use it again, don't throw it away. So uh, an example being, say you buy something like uh, a, a yogurt and uh, it's a pla plastic pot that it's in. Mm -hmm. Instead of throwing it away when you've used it, you could maybe plant a plant in there and <laughs> use it as a, as a plant pot. So uh, that's an example of reusing. And then the other one that David was talking about is to rethink. So one, you can think about like, how am I using plastic in my life? What plastic uh, have I got here? What am I doing with my plastic? So rethink. And also plastic you've got, re you can rethink what, you, what you're using it for. Like I just gave an example. Like, you know, you have a yogurt, a yogurt pot. Instead of chucking it out in the trash, you can say, okay, I can plant a seed in there or a cutting of a plant. And it, it's a plant pot. So uh, these are, are, are all the things which, again, all of us can do. Like... 
uh, and and, if, and and I'm not saying we do all of them, right. but any, anything that any of us do is a help. Right. Yeah. And uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to encourage people. I'm trying to inspire people. And getting back to Greta, I know Greta is trying to inspire people. She gets upset, and uh, and I understand it because uh, all these people, who, the people who are in charge of the planet, the world leaders, and the people who run the big corporations are doing more or less nothing. They make speeches and they talk about you know what they're doing, but they don't actually do it. Right. And in fact, that they do, they open up something else. You know, they instead of saying like. We're, we're stopping the mining or we're stopping the use of the fossil fuels. They say, well, we're actually opening another coal mine or we're, we're drilling for some more oil. So that they, they're not stopping. They are continuing. And it, business as usual is the phrase. Well, and, Steve uh, Andrews, you, you've given a lot of people a lot of things to think about. Now, I definitely want to find out how to grow my own butterflies. I think that is a, a terribly cool idea to have out on my front porch, uh, a caterpillar farm uh, to grow butterflies. I'd love to see butterflies. I just moved from the city to the country, uh, my wife's idea, but I'm getting used to it. You know, but uh, I did move to the country and I feel like I can I could breathe a little bit better. There's trees around me rather than apartment space. But c go ahead, Steve. Fantastic. Yeah, um, this is something, that I, again, that I, I, I talk about. And in fact, I've done public public talks, you know, about this. And I've, I've written for newspapers about this. And I've written for magazines about this. And oh, I tell people, you know, to their face. And, and uh uh, I'm trying to encourage people again worldwide to help the butterflies and uh, butterfly gardening is something you can do so if you've got a garden you can grow plants for butterflies and and uh, there are there's two things to think about there is you can grow flowers for the adult butterflies to feed from for you know to take the nectar from from the flower and you can also grow the plants that, that their caterpillars need and this is something like really, really so important that uh, I know like a lot of people think caterpillars, they eat leaves, which is true, they do. But people don't realize that lots of the species of the moths and the butterflies out there, the caterpillars can only eat one type of plant, one type of food plant, or maybe all the plants that are related to it. So, for example, in America, butterfly, we've been talking about the monarch. The monarch butterfly's caterpillar can eat milkweed species. There are lots of milkweed species in America. They grow all the way from, from the, uh, the lower parts of Canada, all the way right down to Mexico, California, Florida. And there are different types of milkweed. I, I'm not sure how many, but there are a lot of different types of milkweed. And they're suited to growing in, in swampy areas, semi-desert areas, colder areas, hot tropical, kind of subtropical areas, all the different ranges of, of the countryside you've got there, there are types of milkweed that can grow there. And so at one point in time for the, for the monarch butterfly, it was wonderful. Like the monarch butterfly could, could fly from the south, from California and Florida, up to the lower parts of Canada and the northern states and New York and areas like that. And there was going to be milkweed of some variety growing there. But that's not the case now because there's been so much destruction of milkweed by the farmers uh, using the Roundup that uh, it, it's gone. It's just not there. So uh, one thing which people helping monarchs are doing in America is that they're growing milkweed. And, and as I say, this is something I'm doing here. This is something I was doing when I was in Tenerife. And I can give you an example. This was amazing. I, I mean, I'm proud of this. And I, and I know like people say, oh, pride goes before a fall. Mm -hmm. I actually think pride is good. I think if more people were proud of themselves, of what they can do, and of their neighborhood and their country and all this stuff we can be proud of, the better the world would be. And... Uh, Anyway, like uh, I'm proud of the fact that once in Tenerife, I had 50 monarch butterflies all emerged from chrysalises in the same week. And I saw all those fly away. And I only had at that point in time, I had an apartment with a balcony, a terrace. Yeah, I didn't have a garden. I had to grow all my plants in, 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 in plant pots. 
and uh, I still manage to do that. And, and I, I know I inspired people in Tenerife, and in fact, I've still got friends over there that are doing this, that they grow the milkweed for the monarch butterflies, and, and they see them fly away. Well, you've inspired so, me, uh, Steve Andrews, and hopefully you've inspired my listeners as well. Uh, I want to see more butterflies in the area and, and, and all around. My, that's you're a fascinating man and i i i I do i do want to wind this thing down at some point i know that you have so much to say we can go hours and hours talking about the climate and such but i want people to follow you your videos on your youtube are in particular so entertaining but then they they also have a message such a message and i know that the the last the latest youtube uh, video that you have on there you actually got people on zoom like many people to be in unison while you were singing a song that is uh, something that's difficult to do i know over the last year people were trying to uh, uh choral teachers and and uh, uh music teachers were trying to get figure out how to get their bands together with zoom calls and you managed to do it you made a song with uh, i don't know about 20 different people uh, you know uh, all it was this all over the world i didn't i didn't pay attention that much on it but tell tell people about the the youtube and the various uh, places that they could find the bard of ely okay um well uh you can find the bard of ely at steve andrews dot info if you if you uh you go to steve andrews dot info that takes you to my landing page and my landing page takes you to the Bard of Ely page, uh, which is a bardofely.org. Yes, it does. Uh, but basically, and also if you just Google Bard of Ely, well, you find too much. I, I'm like, I've said it, it's all too much. It, I, I'm too much. In some no, ways. it's not too much, um, but it lays it out in three different columns. You have the, the famous Cardiffian, the musician and naturist, and the author yep. and TV star right there lays it out in basic form who you are what you're about how you want people to get involved and and you want this to go worldwide you you want people to to, to know about you know not just you it, it's bigger than you it's bigger than all of us oh, yeah, yeah, you know yeah, we have to get together so. on um, this and uh i just could say like yeah so i i want people to be helping butterflies worldwide as i've just tried to explain the one way is grow plants flowers for the adult butterflies and the plants for the caterpillars of the caterpillars so you'd have to find out what butterflies in your area what plants they eat yeah uh i'm just very quickly because I, I know you want to wind up no, in, in the uk there's a city the city of hull the city of hull uh two years ago got known in the media as the Butterfly City. How it did this was it was planting buckthorn uh, trees all around the city. And buckthorn is the only food for the brimstone butterfly caterpillar. The brimstone is beautiful, it's yellow. Yeah, it's a beautiful butterfly. And so, like, if you wanted to see more brimstone butterflies in the UK, one good way of doing this would be growing the buckthorn tree. So, that's what I say about butterflies. Grow the plants for the caterpillars and the, and the flowers for, for the adult insects. Well, we got I'm milkweed. also very concerned about Go frogs. Ahead. Oh, frogs. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, gosh, frogs, yeah. I'm a member of the Save the Frogs um, charity, which, which started in America. Uh, it was founded by a guy called Dr. Kerry Krieger. And Kerry's a friend of mine. I've, he actually came over to Portugal the other year. We met over here. But uh, this year, he, he had Save the Frogs Day, which I was a big part of. I did some songs for Save the Frogs Day. And, but again, like the butterflies, all around the world, the frogs have got problems. But not just the frogs. The toads have got problems. The newts have got problems. The salamanders have got problems. So all the amphibians. So, again, you know, people can help the amphibians. If you've got a garden, if you have a pond in your garden, mm -hmm. wonderful. The frogs and newts and, and toads can use that pond. Well, these are all the little and, animals that I used to play with as a boy. Uh, all my friends, you know, all my, my male friends and I would, would go play in the yard, out in the streets, in, in, the, in the Everglades, in the swamps. Uh, I, I was living in in Miami and and, and Fort Lauderdale and 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 there's Everglades, there's swampy area, there's plenty of of animals that uh, to see and explore. And, and uh, okay, I'm going to become a little bit older 
right now. These kids today, they don't go outside. They play their video games and they don't go outside and play and see nature and put their toes in it. But uh, I'm glad to see that you were or to hear that you were a, a boy that went out and played. And I encourage all the parents to push push those kids on outside. Um, uh, thank, thank you. That is absolutely spot on. And uh, I just realized something. Oh, my God, I've got to go. I just seen the time is actually nine o'clock now. Um, I'm actually booked into something else. So uh, let's get the I'm last. So sorry. I've no, no problem. Go. Let's get the last um, words for the people. Uh, give me uh, some last words, Steve Andrews, the Bard of Ely. Uh, do what you can worldwide to help the butterflies, the frogs, to cut down on the plastic pollution and anything else you can think of. And take some action. And, and that's what it's about. And thank you so much for having me on your show tonight. Well, there you have it, party people. There you have it, my friends. Steve Andrews, the Bard of Ely. He did not disappoint. This man is becoming the change that he wants to see in the world and getting other people on board as well. That's what you have to do. Not just build up awareness, but actually do the do. do you know, walk the walk, talk the talk. I know it seems cliche, and it actually is cliche to do all the words that I've been saying. But you got to go out there, not use so many bags, not use... Uh, no, so many. I, I know they were picking on straws over the last few years. You're, you're using too many straws. Well, really, it, it's bigger than the straws. It's the the drinking, uh, you, if, if the the unreusable drinking bottles that you're using. Those are pretty bad. Plastic bags. Those are pretty bad. Uh, you know, I, I, my wife is definitely much better than on this than I am. She has a whole car load full of. Uh, of reusable cloth bags in the back of her vehicle. I need to get some of those bags and use them myself. At least I use the same lunchbox every day, and I, I try to uh, to keep all the same uh, items in there. I, I use the the recyclable. You know, I I, I do some things. And he, and ugh, every you know, speaking to somebody like Steve Andrews makes me under, makes me realize I'm not doing as much as I should. I could do more. I could do more. Thank you, Steve Andrews, for pointing that out, making me feel bad about myself. I need to do more <laughs> to help save the earth. It's the only one we got. I don't think we're getting going to be colonizing in a big way Mars or the moon in any uh, major kind of way. I mean, we might be able to get out there and, and, uh, and, and keep the, the human race going. But if we want to keep living the way we are right here on Mother Earth, we got to take care of her. We really, really do. My goodness. I I, ha I do. I have to take ownership. I have to take care of this earth. There. I take ownership. <laughs> Steve Andrews, I look forward to talking to you again. I look forward to following you around on your various social medias. I put them all in the show notes so you can find out. But the big one is steveandrews.info. And then uh, the Bard of Eli uh, shows up. Bard of Eli. Uh, Bard of Eli. Bard of Ely .org, uh, B A R D O F E L Y dot org, and Steve Andrews dot org is the uh, is common uh, dot info. Steve Andrews dot info is common spelling. So yeah, find him, follow him, help him if you can. Do it. That's it for this edition of What Makes You Famous. Now, if you, I'm turning my attention to you, would like to tell your story, I encourage you to give me a call, 501-470-6386, or email info at radiowhat.com. That's it for me. It's Keys Dan, radiowhat.com, djlittlerock.com. Peace. I'm out of here.